Hey, J.D. here. Welcome to the Mead House. You know, over the past several years, we've brought you over 150 episodes of mead-making education, information, and entertainment. More than 100 guests have stopped by the Mead House, professional mead makers, medal-winning home mead makers, competition organizers, experts on yeast and honey, and brewers just like you and me have all visited to share their knowledge. Hey, the Mead House is produced for home mead makers and brewers looking for a bit of inspiration and information from the many guests and discussions we have here at the house. You can help support the Meat House by joining the Meat House Keyholder Club on Patreon. Just go to patreon.com and search for the Meat House. There's also a link in the show notes. For as little as two bucks a month, you can become a keyholder. We've teamed up with some great companies to provide thank you gifts for your support. So get on over to Patreon, join the Meat House Keyholder Club, and get your own set of keys to the Meat House. You can listen to the Meat House podcast with your favorite player and be sure to rate us five stars on iTunes or your favorite listening venue, the Meat House, meat making entertainment you just don't want to miss. Pioneering together since 1869, Yakima Chief Hops is a 100% grower-owned network of family hop farms building strong relationships between the growers who supply their super premium hops and the innovative brewing customers who utilize them in their beers. A Yakima Chief Hop works hard to ensure high standards of excellence in how their hops are dried and processed to preserve the brewing value and overall quality. Hey, upscale your brew to new heights of Yakima Chief Hops, yakimachief.com. It should be the only choice you need for quality hops. And hey, thank you, Yakima Chief, for supporting the Mead House 2020 Iron B. Hey, welcome to the Mead House. And hey, thanks for listening to episode number 171. You know, I was just hanging some new curtains in the front room when Jeff and Ryan showed up. I'm J.D. Webb, and I'll probably have to feed the hogs after they leave. Hey, does anybody know where you can listen to the Meat House podcast? I do. How about iTunes, Stitcher Radio, Spotify, iHeart Radio, YouTube, and just on and on and on. And soon, we'll be on Amazon Music. Hey, check the front page of the website for more locations. That's be meathouse.com. Uh, tonight, uh, in this episode... Uh, you know, you'd, you'd have a hard time brewing beer or building a braggot without malt. Uh, but what if you have an intolerance for gluten? What then? Uh, well, after securing a master's degree in food science and safety from my favorite university, Colorado State, that is, and a passion for craft beer and a need to experiment, we're glad to have Twilight Souls here to shed some light. And in uh, segment two and three, we're just going to dump it right into Facebook friends friends and and Reddit friends. Uh, Of course, this is where we try to answer questions from mead makers like you and I, with no formal expertise other than what we've experienced in our own brew house. All that and more here at the Mead House. But first, hey, thanks to all the Mead House key holders like Melissa Wolf, who joined recently in helping to keep the Mead House podcast free. You too can become a Meat House key holder and help support the show for as little as two bucks a month. We got some great thank you gifts that Jeff will send out to you. So get on over to patreon.com, search for the Meat House, or you can just click on the link in the show notes. What are we drinking tonight? Guys, I'm double fisting it, and it's all mead. <laughs> Something new for JD. Uh, I have a bottle here, Ryan. It's marked Pantry. I think it's Pantry Clean Out Braggot. Uh, I've got a funny feeling these came out of your fridge. Yeah, the pantry. It's got a really, and no, I cheated, okay? I had a little sip before we uh, started recording. So <laughs> I uh, I get a, a lot of roast. It smells like a, it smells like a porter or a real rich, actually not a porter. It smells more like a, um, well, maybe a porter, like a real rich porter. Um, 
has a, ooh, man. It's got a very pronounced roasty, uh, like a roasted barley uh, right up front in your face. Now, when I first tried it, it had a little bit of a, a pucker there, but that seems to have gone away as it warmed up here a little bit. This is something that you would probably enjoy on a cold winter's night in front of a fire. Mm. Not bad. Um, what? So, do you recall what was in the pantry clean-out? Again, this is what I do about once or twice a year. I make a, a braggot with all of the odds and ends that are left over from uh, other batches. So, yeah, there was some roasted barley in there. There was some um, bullshade honey in there. Uh, there was, I oaked that one pretty good. Mm -hmm. I used um, cocoa nibs. I steeped some cocoa nibs in, in secondary. Uh, there's, you know, I, I think that one has a really high concentration of bow shade honey, or at least, at least, uh, you know, more than some of the other versions I've done of this have been. So yeah, it, it, um, I got you a bottle, you know, right off the bat, but I think this one's going to age pretty well and, and develop a little more of almost a barley wine, uh, characteristic. Yeah, I think so. Uh, and and uh, put a check mark on all of the above. I got the wood. The barley really shines through. The cocoa nibs kind of in the background a little bit. Uh, this is definitely something that I, I think my wife would even, Raven would love this, I'm sure. Uh, she's a big fan of dark beers. Uh, in my other fist is uh, Abstinence in the Abbey. And this is another one of the Monk's Meads offerings. Oh, my. <laughs> oh boy um uh, wow this is like the third one that i've had guys um and i can't the, the writing on it is really dark and i can't see it but um wow um almost tastes like some, i don't know if that ginger Almost tastes like a like a like there's a ginger in it, but this is this is pretty damn good. Uh, I'm telling you, this is three out of three uh, from Monk's Mead that I've had. Uh, I'm still going. I'm still going uh, berserk over that last one I had, that butterscotch thing. I still can't believe uh, what you know uh, how that turned out. This abstinence in the Abbey Monk's Mead. Um, guys, you got to try this. Uh, I mean, this is, I mean, I wish I could pass the bottle around the table. Uh, it'd be kind of hard to do to shove the bottle through the microphone, but Hey, if you can pick up a bottle of this, do it. Uh, this is really, uh, really good. Um, yeah, nice job. Mm. Mm. And I got the whole bottle to myself tonight because the wife is at work. <laughs> She's not going to like this. She's going to come home with an empty bottle. And uh, I'll hear about it in the morning, I'm sure. So uh, that's what I'm doing tonight. Two glasses of mead. Uh, Jeff, what did you put in your glass tonight? You know, some days I try to do something thematically related with my two glasses because it's fun to do that. Mm -hmm. um, tonight the theme is I was in a hurry and grabbed two interesting looking bottles out of the fridge. Uh, I like how you put that. <laughs> <laughs> No, I uh, I left work. I took five steps to home, and uh, my wife goes, hey, by the way, I've got friends coming over tomorrow while I'm off work. Um, I need your help to clean. And I was like, oh, hmm. okay. <laughs> so I, I I got off the second job, so to speak, about 15 minutes ago. Uh, got ready for the podcast, and here I am. Um, the first bottle in my hand comes from, or comes up by way of Ryan, uh, this just has a, uh, a little bottle cap with a green piece of painter's tape that says avocado caraway. Um, and judging from the color of this, it's, it's got kind of a dark brownish red. Um, I'm guessing avocado at least is a varietal honey and not, uh, not you know, not, uh, <laughs> not so, a ingredient in here. Yeah, um, squeezed avocado in the sure. secondary. <laughs> 
I'm sure it'd be great with toast. Yeah. <laughs> um, so definitely got that. Yeah, I've, I've got to be right at least on the the multi uh, avocado honey part of this because yeah, it's got that avocado honey kind of multi smell to it on the nose. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Um, there is that honey sweetness to it. It's also got hmm. It <coughs> Ooh. you that okay? Surprise vault by itself. <laughs> yeah, a little went down the wrong pipe, but I think we'll be fine. Uh, it's got a kind of a weird. It's not bitter. It's not sour, but it's almost bitter. Uh, it, it's kind of like a contrasty flavor that I'm not sure exactly how to describe, but it's there. Uh, it adds a, a note of interest to this that it's a little odd enough putting right at front. And then, you know, as I have a second and a third sip, I'm starting to like it. So um, definitely an interesting one. I'll probably be pondering this for uh, a while as I finish the bottle. Um, <laughs> my second glass comes from Redstone Meadery. This is Nectar of the Hops. Uh, this is their hop mead. And this is not a braggot. This is just a mead that they've added hops to. Mm. And I forget how much I like this style because uh, this is, I made uh, like a, a hopped traditional um, for my wedding going on nearly five years ago now um, that was basically the star of the evening. <sighs> yeah, no. This is this is uh, just a fantastic style, especially for a kind of warm, you know, summer evening like tonight. Um, the bitterness kind of calms down the honey flavor, but that that hop character also kind of just enhances that perception of sweetness, if you know what I mean. Uh, again, this is another contrasty one that's just really interesting, light, refreshing. It's got a nice amount of carbonation to it that uh, just kind of tickles the tongue as it's going down. So. I've got two nice ones in my glass tonight. Mm, sounds good. Uh, I, I was just able to uh, find some decent light here and read some of this uh, uh, this uh, label here on this abstinence in the Abbey. Now, uh, I can only read part of it because my eyeballs just ain't what they used to be. Uh, mead with uh, coriander, orange peel. Uh, that's about as far as I got. <laughs> so... Uh, but definitely coriander. Uh, you get a little bit of that orange peel uh, again. Uh, but uh, I, I, I don't know. Uh, I, I get this. Uh, uh, I get this other other flavor in there, and although it's not mentioned on the on the label, but the bottom line, it's damn good. Uh, Ryan, uh, where are we as far as Mead House North and uh, organizing the brew room? What's in your glass tonight? Well, I, uh, you know, kind of in the theme of our of our guest tonight, I also reach for a bottle of abstinence in mm-hmm. the Abbey, mm-hmm. and I I am greatly enjoying it. As abstinence in the Abbey, Belgian inspired, so it's made with coriander, orange peel, grains of paradise, hops, and aquafava. We'll get back to that in a second. Uh, a story of choice. So you've decided to give abstinence a try. Try it with friends or strangers or lovers. Enjoy it in the middle of the day, in the dark, in the city, or a park. There you go. <laughs> uh, uh, what are we abstaining from? Green, gluten, and the norm. Please enjoy your abstinence in modification. Um I'm sorry. Please enjoy your absence in moderation and make monks a part of your story. Uh, this is, yeah, the the really interesting. Uh, it's got you know the classic you know Belgian whip flavors in there, but the aquafava. This is how he was trying to give it some body, and he did that by soaking chickpeas. Chickpeas. And I, think that's he it. Said, I think he had sixty. Was it sixty pounds of chickpeas or something? Yeah. And uh, it was like sixty pounds of chickpeas, like five. Well, however many that is. What is that? Uh, 
12 five gallon buckets of, something like of that yeah. yeah and um and he soaked them in water and then he uh you know just strained them and used the water from the chickpeas as as the liquid really really interesting i mean you know it, it does give it a lot of great body you yeah. know, it doesn't it it's it, I don't think you can open a can of garbanzo beans and you know pour out the liquid and get no. the exact same thing as <laughs> no. you're gonna do yourself. But no, you know, um, my wife is is Lebanese, and there's a you know big Lebanese community here, and and we there's a couple of festivals here, usually like a spring festival and a big fall festival, and and there's lots of uh, falafels and hummus and you know, all this stuff. It probably wouldn't be that hard for me to get, you know, that many chickpeas <laughs> and and soak them and then have them used, right? Like yeah. just like the week before the festival, and I mean, we they they, you know, go through that many chickpeas making falafels and, uh, you know, over the course of the weekend, I'm sure. So this it's it's really interesting. I I agree. It's it's a uh, a great it's a great one to try. You can get your hands on this. Uh, I think they do sell online. Uh, check it out. Monks, Monks Meadery Abstinence in the Abbey. Good stuff. All right. Uh, what was that, JD? Good stuff. Good stuff. Great minds think alike. There you go. So, as JD said, from his favorite university, uh, alum Twyla. A soul joins us. She had her undergrad degree in nutrition from Miami University. That's that's not JD's favorite, um, <laughs> but a master's degree in food science and safety from Colorado State. Which uh, <laughs> what are, are these? The Rams or the Horns or what? What's their mascot? <laughs> the I, think it, I can picture it. It's something like that. Uh, yes, the, the Rams. The ra- <laughs> You'll have to uh, pardon Ryan. <laughs> The horns. I, I don't know. I've been picturing the mascot. I don't know what it was yet. Uh, Keep going. Uh, she focused on malting and brewing science in bioactive and probiotic compounds. You don't buy more probiotics now than I ever have in my life. I think that's just the factory getting old. Um, you old? No. Passion- Come on, dude. You're not old. I'm old. <laughs> Yeah, you're ancient. Yeah. Um, <laughs> keep ro- keep pa- rolling. <laughs> a passion for craft beer and gluten intolerance changed, challenged her to experiment malting and brewing with non traditional brewing grains as a student. She believes all people should have access to high quality food and beverage, regardless of an intolerance or allergy. And she founded Grouse Malt House in 2013 i swear i i have not had much of that bottle yet this is just this is just sober fumbling yeah. over words tonight <laughs> um Twyla is also a founding board member of the north american craft maltsters guild uh welcome to the show Twyla, and what's in your cup tonight uh hello i'm happy to be here thanks for inviting me and tonight i am drinking a um the globe trotter goza from holiday Lee brewing company uh it's got a pretty zesty citrusy aroma and uh, a wonderful balance of tart and salty um at a four percent avd it's going down pretty smooth <laughs> mm. excellent well thank you for joining us tonight we have um you know, in, in the mead community, quite a few folks, uh, not all, have found it or become a larger part of it because of gluten intolerance. Mm-hmm. And uh, when we uh, came ag- across uh, Grouse Malt House, um, we were really interested in, in chatting with you. Uh, and, and finding out more about that, one of the larger category, I should say, one of the um, one of the more uh, passionate categories of mead making is uh, braggots, which are 
um, the I think the, uh, the what's the, what's the definition? The harmonious marriage of malt and honey. <laughs> something like <laughs> and, that, yeah. Something like that, and uh, and trying to um, be able to craft braggots that allow our uh, friends with uh, some intolerances to still make and and have delicious uh, meats. And there's a um, there's a gluten free brewery near me in St. Paul, Minnesota, called Burning mm-hmm. Brothers. And uh, they use sorghum as their primary uh, grain. And I know that that is pretty common in the folks that I know who, who make beer uh, without barley. But you guys have a much wider uh, variety of, of grains to choose from. Um, and we asked our key holders if they had some questions for you and uh, some of them did. So I'd love to get right into, into one of them. Uh, this, this comes from uh, Josh M. Uh, Josh is a, a brewer that has an intolerance and he said that he is planning on using your red wing amber millet in a braggot. And this is the first time he'll be using millet malt. Uh, since it's a braggot, and he's not really concerned with extracting sugars from the malt. He's going to get all of his sugars from the honey. Uh, okay. And I can always supplement with more honey. So he's going to you know, use, use the honey to get to that, uh, the gravity that he likes. Um, the malt would be used primarily for flavor. Uh, do you know approximately what the conversion percentage is without enzyme additions? Oh, wow. I didn't read this one all the way. I didn't mean to start you out with a hard one. I didn't mean to put you on the spot there. <laughs> um, but yeah, I talked about the, uh, the conversion of uh, without enzymes or maybe even with enzymes of some of the, the, um, the millet or some of your other uh, malts that, that, um, you know, might not be so familiar to, to brewers. Sure. Um, well, I guess I think that that, that braggot is going to turn out really well and, and what a malt to, to pick if there was only one malt to, to use for, for color and, and flavor, I would definitely, um, I would choose the Red Wing uh, Millet Malt. It's one of our newest malts. It's got about a 30 SRM in color and very, um, robust flavors with caramel and toffee, raisin, um, sweet breakfast cereal. So that one is, is a really delicious malt. And um, if you were to just use that, I think that there's a lot of variables, right, with brewing um, with gluten-free malt more so than with a barley malt because it um, really, this, our varieties that we're working with have not been optimized over thousands of years for with breeding um, for for brewing purposes. So we're, we're combating a few things. And if you were to use our, our malts in general um, without exogenous enzymes and without doing um, a decoction method, I would I would say that you're looking at about um, a 45 to 50 percent extract that you could expect out of that at normal brewing temperatures. Um, however, if, if we're looking to, to really optimize that and, and, and get, um, get the most you can out of this upwards of, of 80% extract, um, and, and then the, that wort being fermentable, um, we would definitely want to use exogenous enzymes. And we would also want to use a, a modified mash procedure. I call it thinking outside the mash ton. We actually want to hit a higher mash temperature than what you would be used to with a barley brew. Um, and that is because our gluten-free grains that we use um, have a higher gelatinization temperature. So it's advantageous to hit a higher mash temp so that we um, fully gelatinize those starches and that those exogenous enzymes are able to do um, their best work to break down those starches into smaller sugars. Excellent. That's great. I, uh, 
uh, he had a uh, then the second part of his question he had said mm -hmm. um are there any potential flavors other that may develop if you don't add an enzyme you know, versus flavors. using an enzyme mm -hmm. Yeah, no, the, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, he's, yeah. Um, he, I just wanted to correct Ryan for a minute. Are there any potential ne uh, negative flavors he's asking that might develop if he doesn't add the enzyme? Well, well maybe there's positive ones uh, too, JD. I did a little yeah. edit there. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't believe that you would see any, um, any change in, in flavor initially. Um, if you weren't, to use enzymes, there is definitely a possibility of there just being more you know, longer chains of, of starch. And so over, over time in a finished product, that would not age as well as it would if it was fermentable. So um, over time, I think there would be a detriment to, to not using enzymes, but initially and um, and certainly for, for homebrew applications, I, I don't think that there would be a downside of, of say, steeping um, this malt in a, in a bag to add color and flavor to, to a brew. Great. So you've got uh, the, you know, just looking here, you know, you get the Pale millet, Munich millet, Vienna millet, you know, just to name a few. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if I was going to make, a, say, an Oktoberfest, I was going to use the pale and the Munich and, and that kind of thing. Uh, would, if, you, if we were doing the, the, the Coke, the Coke Pepsi challenge here, dating myself a little bit, um, <laughs> would I pick up a, 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 just some really distinct differences? of saying you know it was made with um with a barley malt or a millet malt again if you just if you followed those kind of procedures that you talked about the the thinking outside the mash tun as you had said <laughs> um i i know with experience and our customers have definitely proven this to be true that by utilizing you know a combination of of different malts um, and, and the reason that we offer over 20 different types of malts and roast is that you can make any style of beer that you'd like and hit the flavor and other targets that you're, that you're um, trying to replicate from a, a barley-based brew with these non-traditional malts. So I've seen, you know, every style for the most part. <laughs> Um, although there are still a few that I'm holding out on to, um, for some of our customers to make, but, um, I've definitely had a delicious Oktoberfest, you know, a black IPA and, and so many styles that, um, that were made with our products that tasted true to style. Great. Um, all right, let's get, uh, let's get another one here. We got one from Jacob. T. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, we're jumping right into these. I want to make sure I, I get them. We tend to sometimes get off on, on conversations that, hey, that no go problem. off the rails actually... and before I know it, we don't uh, get to our established questions. Um, oh, here's, here's a good one from Jacob T. Uh, how did you establish your niche selling to gluten-free home brewers or professionals? Um, any equipment you regret purchasing or something <laughs> after you got it, you thought to yourself, why didn't I have this the whole time? Mm -hmm. I guess that's, I got two different questions here. I think one of them is just about uh, establishing your niche. And, and then the second one is uh, just any, any equipment that you regretted or, or really liked. Well, establish, establishing grounds definitely was, was a process. I started um, malting and gluten-free, uh, malting and brewing with gluten-free grains in 2009. Um, and it took several years to, um, to start Grouse and, um, Grouse was established in, in 2013. And at that point, the, um, our market was, was very small and we knew we needed to start small, but start somewhere. So, um, my, my late husband and I bought a, a 
piece of dairy equipment, a thousand gallon dairy mix tank, and we retrofitted it into a very small um, two ton or one ton at best, 2000 pounds um, uni malting system. So we were able to steep and germinate and kiln all in one vessel. And, um, and we, you know, how we connected initially with, with several of our um, initial customers was, was an, um, a homebrew forum that was not, nece- not necessarily dedicated to gluten-free, but there was just um, a string of, of gluten-free brewers. And um, I met one of the original founding members of, of Ghost Fish Brewing Company on that forum. Um, also um, one of the founding members of Oryx um, out, of, out of Pittsburgh on that forum. So it was very much grassroots um, to get started. At, and then we obviously grew from there. And then equipment, you know, as I have already attested to, there wasn't really small scale multi equipment and, and we needed to start small scale. So um, relatively recently in, in Grouse's growth, we, we got into a, um, a germination kiln drum and this gkv is um is the piece of equipment that i definitely wish i had when we had gotten started because um malting was very 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 manually um, manual initially and now um to have the automation and to not have to put on boots and grab a shovel to to stir the grain as it's germinating but rather just watch this drum rotate on its own. It is, um, it is wonderful to witness. That's great. I think, uh, completely different, but what you got, but this question got me thinking about, was there any equipment that I purchased that I thought to myself, why didn't I have this the whole time or that I regret purchasing, (laughs) you know, um, I use a stir plate a lot less than I thought I would when I bought it. (laughs) That's about it for me. I'll get you guys uh, in the next segment. Uh, Let's do one more here um, while we're still being disciplined. Uh, Dan C. Dan C. wants to know which gluten-free grains you would recommend uh, to increase head retention. Mm -hmm. Um, well, we would recommend buckwheat malt. This is actually not a grain. It's, um, but, um, it is, it is a seed that we malt at, the, um, at grouse. And we, after years of experimentation, um, we recommend buckwheat malt to be utilized at, at about 25% of, of, um, a malt bill in order to increase head retention as well as increased body. So I would recommend buckwheat. So I see there's there's uh, quite a variety of, of the buckwheat here, of everything from, you know, pale to roasted. Um, are all of them going to provide that, that head retention? And then were you saying that even if you wanted to go with a roasted, you could you could go at, at a pretty high percentage? You know, I definitely would not recommend the roasted buckwheat at, at, at a, you know anywhere near a twenty five percent. That would just be very way too way too roasty. Um, would would recommend using the the roasted malts at a, a much lower percentage. Um, but but the pale buckwheat and um, would definitely recommend utilizing that. Okay. You know, I had a couple of buckwheat meads last night. I think you should. I think, uh, I think, who said that question? Um, Dan. I think Dan should make a buckwheat meat braggot with buckwheat malt. So buckwheat honey and buckwheat malt. I think that's, (laughs) that's what I'd like to, that's what I'd like to see him do. There you go. JD, what are you thinking here? I know you were gonna you were gonna jump in. Yeah, I'm looking. Uh, man, there's so many interesting. I didn't know all this stuff was even out there. Uh, I mean, who'd have known? Um, 
I'm looking at this uh, M1250, MI1250, I guess it is, chocolate roast. Uh, cocoa nibs, a bit of cocoa flavor. Um, tell me more about that, uh, Twyla, this chocolate roast. Uh, uh, what's it like? Oh, you know, just like the, the description says, um, what I really love about the chocolate roast is that that malt can be used in a, in a um, decently um, high percentage, relatively when you're talking about a, a roast bill in, in a malt, um, in the grist. So to, uh, to really bolster the, the color and the flavor and not have to utilize too much of, say, the dark roasted or our, um, our caramel 240L, those products, you know, really bring the color with a 300 SRM um, with a much more intense bitter cocoa flavor. So the chocolate roast, we've had a lot of customers use that as more of the, the backbone of the roast in, say, a stout or a porter yeah. um, because it, it's it's super smooth um, and delicious chocolatey flavor. Well, one, one of the uh, one of the recipes that I've been toying around with and I haven't done yet is something using a caramelized honey with some darker roast like uh, barley's and uh, chocolate uh, and, and whatnot. And I'm I'm looking at even the dark roast uh, next to it, intense mm -hmm. bitter cocoa flavor that uh, MI thirteen hundred or ML. I guess mm -hmm. it's MI thirteen hundred. Uh, gosh, I'm you know. Uh, I'm thinking of something along a porter type or a stout type mead, uh, mm -hmm. like I said, and then using some dark grains. But I also need uh, that caramel type flavor. Is there anything there that you would recommend along yeah. with the chocolate or, or, or the dark roast as well? Mm -hmm. um, a relatively new addition to our product lineup is um, is roasted caramels. Um, so we have a, um, three different options there. We've got a 90L, oh, um, a 120 level bond, and a, and a 240. So I would definitely lean into this, that our 240 level bond, um, or a 300, around a 300 SRM um, caramel, which has a very sweet chocolatey flavor, um, more dark toffee, molasses. Um, that, that would be really delicious in combination with uh, some of the chocolate roast you know we, at MI-1250. You know, we, we joke with each other here on the show about putting pen to paper. Uh, <laughs> Jeff and Ryan, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm scratching on the paper right now with my pen. I'm taking notes. Uh, uh, you know, uh, this is really interesting to me. Now, I, I, I have a question for you. I, I read your bio online here, and you had talked mm -hmm. about you had uh, this intolerance uh, issue, uh, which was apparently quite devastating uh, personally. And then you tried beer after beer, <laughs> gluten beer after beer. What, what, what happened between then and now? What, what took place, do you think? Well, um, my, I, I do have a gluten intolerance. I didn't actually learn that I could benefit from, um, from a gluten-free lifestyle until I was actually well underway of starting grouse. Um, I was introduced to gluten-free beer from a, um, a fellow student when I was at CSU. I happened to take an elective course that was that sounded like fun, brewing science and technology. Oh, yeah. And in that class, there was um, a woman who had celiac disease. And in chatting with her, I, I said, you know, there's got to be gluten-free beers on the market. And she said, um, there are, but they all taste like, like crap. And so I went out to um, the liquor store that night and I bought a beer, a gluten-free beer, um, and I was so upset that this was her option because it tasted so awful. Bad, yeah. um, I, and I was so struck by her dedication because she had said she had recently discovered that she had celiac disease. Mm -hmm. And so she had said she, she loved beer, but she really wanted to feel good. And so she was going to pass on all of these beers because she, she was, she wanted to feel good. 
And I was just struck by her dedication. And for whatever reason, in that moment, I decided to make it a mission to help make her a great tasting gluten-free beer. And that led me down the path of, you know, cold calling farmers to get my hands on gluten-free grains. Turns out that Colorado, where Grouse is located, um, produces the, na- the nation's largest amount of, of millet, um, a dry land yeah. crop that is gluten-free. And um, so from there, just putting more pieces together, learning about malting and being fortunate that some craft maltsters around the country were willing to, to take me in and, and teach me what they knew about malting. And I was able to um, translate that into gluten-free malting. Um, I was able to get my hands on equipment, um, uh, Rebel Malting Company uh, in, in Reno, Nevada, Lance Jurgensen let me malt on his system. And with that 600 pounds of malt, I was able to do quite a bit of experimentation just to kind of to prove the concept um, that, that we could make a great tasting beer made with non-traditional grains. And so from there, things just kind of grew organically. And ultimately, I tried eating a gluten-free diet back in early 2013. And it kind of felt like Providence that mm-hmm. um, within two weeks of eating a gluten, of being gluten-free, I felt better than I had in years. I, I'd suffered for almost a decade with an autoimmune disease and was on a whole host of medications. And so it turns out that I was able to um, control this, this disease by eating gluten-free. And I had you know, set up a, a business that was able to provide me with, with gluten-free beer because I just, uh, loved craft beer. What so. better way, huh? <laughs> what better way? Uh, my hat is off to you, Twyla. I mean, uh, unbelievable. Uh, what a story. Um, it has inspired me because I'm looking at all of these roasts. I can't wait to get an order in and try yeah. some of this. This is just amazing to me. Uh, I've also tried gluten-free beers way back, and no thanks. Uh, mm. And I haven't tried one since. Uh, the first couple that I did have was just, I don't know, they just didn't taste like beer to me. And I'm, a, you know, I'm, a, I'm a guy who grew up drinking my dad's beer, you know, Coors mm-hmm. and Miller. I mean, you know, for many, many years. I'm 67 now, so it's been a long time. Uh, but this is uh, interesting to me. I mean, all of these flavors, I mean, from the caramels to this roasted goldfinch with the brown sugars, I'm into that. Uh, uh, I mean, the caramel 120, uh, toffee, caramel, plum, light chocolate, maple sugar. Uh, oh man, I'm telling you, uh, I'm taking notes. <laughs> Good stuff. Ryan, you had, uh, you had one more. Well, yeah, no, I'm, I'm glad you got into the story. That's, I wanted to get into her story and hear more about it after, you know, kind of started coming out of the gate, peppering her with some technical questions. Yeah. You know, I had a, I had a, uh, a goldfinch in my lawn this spring, I, or a yellow, fin- I don't know, is there a difference <laughs> a goldfinch and a yellow finch? I need a, a bird watcher to, to let us know. But no, looking at the, the goldfinch, Millet malt, JD. I thought that was, was going to catch your eye here. Maple and bran flavor, toasted <laughs> cereal, honey and caramel. Uh, that that sounds mm-hmm. absolutely uh, delicious. Um, I'm going to toss it over to Jeff, who said he's got a a question or two. Yeah, I, that the goldfinch uh, does sound really interesting. It's like it has all the the good parts of breakfast cereal kind of flavor notes to it and that was actually kind of what i wanted to ask about because i'm, I'm mm-hmm. looking through your catalog here and mm-hmm. you've got so many interesting flavors that i'm i'm not sure i've ever seen barley be able to produce um like really in particular the ones that really catch my eye are uh, like your your specialty roast millets the american roast and the french roast uh, the american roast mm-hmm. says this, it has a cashew nut flavor Mm-hmm. Um, or a toasted walnut flavor on the French roast. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, wow. So immediately when I see that, I think, wow, that would be great in a stout. 
Oh, and yeah. I'm curious. Oh, my God, yeah. Like, Percentage-wise, for my grain bill, how much of this should I put in there to have a really pronounced nut flavor in the stout? Uh, do, do you have any insight on that? You know, for those lighter roasts, I think you could five to to eight percent. You want to go more than more than more than that, um, mm -hmm. as as kind of the building blocks for um, for that flavor. Obviously, you would want to utilize um, maybe maybe around 2% of, of the dark roast. It really depends on how you, how you build out your, your color um, with some of the sure. darker roasts. But yeah, I would say um, somewhere in that, in that five to 8% range. Okay. That's awesome. I'm a, you know, this is, uh, I've got another, uh, another winter time. <laughs> the work there already. Um, they don't have to be just winter time. Uh, that's true. Yes. Oh, I'm sure not. My wife can attest to that. <laughs> she will drink dark <laughs> beers all year round. I, I got one last question here, Twilo, before you, sure. uh, we let you go here. Um, you know, Jeff was just, I just scrolled up and saw these, these uh, walnut and, and the cashew nut. Is, is it, can we use these uh, gluten-free malts with, Gluten malts. Uh, in other words, if I wanted that cashew nut flavor and I couldn't get it anywhere else, okay, uh, could I use a percentage of that in my in my grain bill using other grains, regular grains? And and oh, absolutely. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, outstanding. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of a nut brown, guys, with a cashew nut base. Oh my God, the wheels are turning yeah. here, Twyla. I'm telling you, that could be good. Yeah. Um, I, I don't have anything else, guys. Uh, I'm just mesmerized by this whole, mm. uh, you know, gluten-free grain thing that, uh, you know, was was once just a kind of an afterthought. And now, mm -hmm. I mean, my God, look at this list of, 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 of malts. I mean, my God. Uh, I wouldn't even mind... So trying to do a, a complete uh, a, a complete recipe uh, with right. this. And I, I guess on the, really on the, the recipe question. oh on the recipe line um, if some of your members or, or, or yourselves are looking for some recipes I would highly recommend using um, checking out the resource that is the glutenfree homebrewing.com. They have done a great job of um, cataloging recipes based on style and so um would would point you that direction glutenfreehomebrewing.com correct okay. uh jeff go ahead you had uh something yeah else. well i think the obvious last question to ask is you know how can we get your malt <laughs> where do we go <laughs> how do how do our listeners get a hold of this um, well, for home brewers, um, we would recommend g going to that website, the glutenfreehomebrewing.com. Um, you can mm -hmm. order our products through that website. Um, and also Ryan's got my contact intro, <laughs> gentlemen. So. Very good. Well, it was a, ple a pleasure joining you this evening. Thank you. Thank you so much well, for inviting me to join you. Well, thank you, Twyla. And again, I mean, you've opened up a whole new world here for a lot of mead makers, I'm sure. Uh, you know, with all of these different flavors, I mean, a lot of us are so used to combining grains, you know, from uh, our local home brew store and, you know, doing the, doing the regular old thing. Uh, and in brewing beer, and of course, Braggots is a big thing on this show. It's just you know, like Ryan said earlier, it's a harmonious blend of beer and, and mead, basically. Uh, just brewing with honey and malts, and uh, coming up with some pretty interesting flavors. We have an annual competition that we started a couple of years back called the Iron Bee, and uh, Braggots has uh, you know been one of the categories. And I'll tell you, man, there's been some phenomenal stuff. Uh, come out of that, that category. So I'm eager for our listeners to get involved in some of this gluten-free. Uh, I don't know how many of them out there we have that are, that are you know, have an intolerance. Uh, but certainly, I mean, beyond that, uh, I'm not intolerant, but I am eager uh, to use some of these grains. So uh, 
Thank you so much for coming aboard tonight and, and sharing all this information. Uh, we'll stay in touch with you for sure. Uh, and uh, maybe we can do this again. Sounds good. All right. My uh, pleasure, guys. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Uh, guys, I, I, you know, I swear, I mean, I, I'm looking, uh, I mean, there's just a ton of stuff here. I'm looking down this list and I, I don't see anything that I couldn't brew a decent beer with or a braggot for that matter. I mean, uh, I'm kind of eager to try this stuff. Well, and all these different flavor notes, like the, you know, the maple and the brand cereal and the cashew and the walnut, it never occurred to me that using different grains, we could get these interesting flavors as opposed to, you know, your standard homebrew store, barley, and maybe some wheat or some rye. Uh, yeah. Wow. This, this is really cool. Absolutely. Absolutely. I still want to see the, I want to see the hundred percent buckwheat braggot. Yeah. <laughs> buckwheat honey, buckwheat malt. There you go. Maybe a few different buckwheat malts, but that maybe that'll be the challenge next year. You know, the, the, the buckwheat challenge. There you go. Hey, you know what? <laughs> we could do that. Let's see. We got ideas. We got we, ideas. Here. We got ideas. We definitely have ideas. All right. Hey, yeah, before we get to Facebook and Reddit friends here, uh, which is a huge part of our, our show, and we l absolutely love some of the questions that we get to uh, attempt to answer here. Uh, before we get to that, uh, let me do this. Uh, hey, from a small part-time startup uh, to provide a college student some extra money for a weekend beer fund to a nationally recognized brand, Spike Brewing, is home to some of the most innovative brewing equipment around. A company that specializes in not only making and building quality brewing equipment, they actually listen to their customers and engineer towards their needs. Spike Brewing, quality brewing products for quality brewing experiences, spikebrewing.com. Make their products your selection for your brewing needs. And thank you, Spike Brewing, for supporting the Mead House 2020 Iron Bee. Uh, hey, rolling right along here. Uh, so, Jamie, before we get into that, yeah, a couple, a couple things. Sure. Uh, so, number one, you heard tonight that we took some questions that our key holders had um, for Twyla. Uh, that's going to be something we do regularly. So, uh, one a key holder, new key holder benefit is um, being able to submit questions uh, for our guests we, we let you know a few days in advance because um, we you know record the show and uh, we'll ask them and, and get you your and, and get those answers so um, look for if you're already a key holder look for those uh, emails to come out as uh, as we get guests lined up and uh, if you are not a key holder again just the the benefits just keep coming so so sign up and and on top of all the great thank you gifts you'll get, you'll also be able to uh, submit questions for our guests on um, on a regular basis. So, I got I got a story for you guys. Okay. Uh, <laughs> there's a there's a, a farmer that that um, doesn't live too far away, you know, not too far out of town, and and he delivers he does home delivery uh in my neighborhood uh one day a week so i you know get like farm fresh eggs and chickens oh, cool. and he's getting into some other stuff too so i get i get these these just fantastic you know local farm fresh eggs delivered to my door mm -hmm. um from this farmer and i mean the, the eggs are i mean these are for, you know he says you know things like free range and gluten free are are kind of terms that the usda you know has definitions around so he doesn't really use those terms mm -hmm. but uh but i mean he goes look they're they're you know in every sense of the word free range organic chickens they're just chickens that wander around the yard you yep. know and you know eat insects and seeds and things like that and and uh just just absolutely you know just delicious eggs i mean they and they come in like this mixed pack right so it's like they might be brown or 
or pale or speckled or blue, blue you know, just yep. whatever, <laughs> whatever kind of variety of the chicken is, I suppose. Um, well, anyway, he comes to the door uh, a few days ago, you know, for his, his delivery. And um, I'm wearing a Nani Moon Meadery T-shirt. And he, and he sees it and he goes, Nani Moon uh, Meadery is He's like, Hawaii. He's like, yeah, I, I was there. I went there on my honeymoon. Oh, my God. <laughs> and he goes, I, I, went, I went there on my, on my honeymoon. We tried uh, a bunch of their meads, and then we, we bought a bunch and had a bunch shipped back. And I said, oh, you like mead, huh? And he goes, yeah, yeah, I like, I like mead. So I said, well, hang on a second. So I went downstairs and got him a little, uh, you know, little four-pack beer holder of, of some mead that I had made and, and said, here, you know. Give these a try, you know. See, uh, see what you, you know, see what you think if you if you like them. So the weirdest things will happen to you, you know. If you're wearing a, you know, wearing these, <laughs> you know, metery t-shirts and yeah. metery hats and stuff that that I know Jeff sent out a bunch. So so be sure to to wear those. Now, I'm where's I'm waiting on if he if he likes those, maybe I can work out some kind of you know meat for eggs uh, trade we can do here um you know how 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 medieval does that sound <laughs> give you, a, you know a, a jug of mead for a basket of eggs you know it's it's funny you should come up with that story because i've got one similar to that uh you know we own property uh, up in the high country in colorado above colorado springs well i am at least probably four or five times a month i get these letters in the mail uh, somebody always wanting to make an offer by my property. And so, you know, once in a while, I'll, I'll just, you know, think I'm pulling a funny ha-ha, and I'll get the guy's email address, and I'll write back, and I'll, I'll just quote some ridiculous price, you know. And so I get a response back from this one guy, uh, and... Uh, you know, he says, uh, you know, let's let's talk about that price. And then, the, you know, uh, and by the way, because uh, he saw the the uh, on my email, it has my name and then the meat house. My address is, uh, or no, it says the meat producer of the meat house and then my my email. So uh, he he made a comment in his reply about me and he says, you brew mead? And I said, well, yeah, how did you hear about it? <laughs> so, you know, it's a small world. So uh, he's a, he's now a listener. Uh, and if I, I don't have his email pulled up here, I mean, if, if, if I, I tell you what, I promise I'll say his name uh, next week. Uh, and I'm sure I'll get an email back from him and uh, uh, thanking me for throwing a shout out. But uh, you know who you are. I know you're listening. Uh, and you know where my property is, so it's kind of a no-brainer there on his side. Uh, but it is a small world, Ryan. Uh, you know, I mean, he just picked up on, uh, you know, it just says my name at the bottom of my email. You know, JD, Whip, producer of the Mead House podcast, and on my email address. And so, <laughs> you, know, you know, just the word Mead uh, set him off. And the next thing I know, I get an email back. Hey, yeah, you know, I like Mead. Uh, you know, uh, listening to the podcast and uh, whatnot. So it's small world, uh, really is. Um, all right, Facebook friends here, uh, let's get on with it. We, we just got a ton of stuff here uh, we've got piled up. Um, guys, uh, I kind of went through, and I, I think I called out all the stuff that we handled last week, but I'm not sure about this one. Uh, this is from James Thomas. Uh, did we talk about this one? Uh uh, no, post. no, I meant to and then forgot about it. Um, okay. Uh, so. Yeah, Jeff, if you got it, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, one of our listeners sent us an email. says, uh, uh, hi, guys. You guys talked about my question I posted on the Micro Mead Brews uh, Facebook group about my mango mead. This was back in uh, uh, episode 169, right before we took our break here. Um, I just wanted to follow up and let you know that I wound up pulling out about 24 ounces of the must adding more water to dilute it. And uh, it says uh, specific gravity of 1040 down from uh, 1052 to see if that would kick it off again. I also pitched some K1V116 
Uh, didn't have any lava yeast earlier. Swirled it two, three times a day while I was swirling. It fizzed madly, just about blew the airlock off, but within seconds after stopping, uh, so did any activity. Um, after six days of this, it started acting like normal ferment and has been chugging along since. I'll measure the gravity in a few days and see where it is. Thanks for discussing this on the podcast. There you go. <laughs> so listening to what he's saying here, it sounds like he had uh, quite a bit of dissolved CO2 in the yeah. solution. Yeah. And, um, yeah, just the mixing it up and getting that out of there, um, all that, that really rigorous bubbling he talked about really briefly, uh, that seems like it probably helped quite a bit. You know, sometimes just stirring it up once in a while. I mean, even, you know, the recommended thing is nothing after seven days. You don't want to touch it. You just want to let it go along its merry way. You know, you've done all your degassing and everything up to that point. Uh, it doesn't hurt to stick your stir stick or whatever you're using back down in the must and just give it a gentle swirl, uh, you know, from the bottom up. Uh, all you're doing is, uh, you know, uh, bringing that, uh, uh, all that uh, stuff on the bottom, that yeast cake uh, that kind of develops over time, uh, getting it, uh, you know, uh, back up into the must again and, uh, you know, resuspended. So, or suspended in, in, into the must. And sometimes that's enough uh, to, you know, to kick it off. So, uh, a little uh, gentle agitation there. Yeah. You know, nothing, you know, I mean, we're not talking, you know, put your wire whip down in there and, and, you know, whip the crap out of it. We're just talking about just a gentle stir just to kind of keep it in. And you can do that two or three times a week or however long your ferment lasts, uh, provided you're not introducing a, a lot of oxygen uh, back into it. So uh, good deal, uh, James Thomas. Uh, good stuff there. Um I think this next one might be for the scientists in our midst. Autolysis <laughs> and racking. Last year I made a four-gallon batch using Coats de Blanc and left it in primary for several months without any noticeable issues compared to my intermediate rack batches using the same yeast. Each of these gallons were in their own separate fermenter. This year I bought a gallon of honey and split it into three-gallon uh, into a three gallon and a one gallon fermenter uh, for another four gallons total using uh, also using Coast de Blanc. Uh, I'm a bit worried about this one because apparently the weight of the mead will accelerate autolysis. Uh, do I need to worry about the three gallon fermenter? Maybe split it up into three separate gallons. Somebody please put their science hat on and handle this <laughs> I, I got you so autolysis is basically it, it's the breakdown of yeast and usually you're seeing that in a mead when uh when the mead is searching for nutrient and sometimes this just happens if you're if you're letting it rest on too much leaves in the first place um generally the autolysis you, you'll know it when you taste it it's a bitter kind of nasty aftertaste that is i've talked about this before it's just hard as hell to hide uh, you can put fruit on it. You can sweeten it up. It's always kind of there. You're at best you're mitigating it. You're not hiding it. Um, that said, autolysis on a three gallon versus a one gallon, you probably don't have much to worry about. The two things that I would be concerned with, if you're really worried about autolysis in general, make sure you're doing a good nutrient regimen ahead of time. You're feeding it right, and then. If you've got a yeast cake and it's starting to clear, it's a good time to rack it. Whether you're racking it to another three gallon or you're splitting it to a one gallon, whatever you've got on hand, um, the the amount of meat doesn't really, to my knowledge, affect the autolysis so much as just letting it sit on a bunch of sludge at the bottom. Uh, you know, we, we talk about racking out a primary when there's a bunch of crud you need to get off the, the yeast. If you're in secondary and you're still getting a big pile of crud, like my rule of thumb is about a half an inch of that, that yeast cake at the bottom. At that point, I go, okay, I got I to gotta make sure I got something clean to get this into in the next week. Um, and that's, that may be even a little conservative on my part. I could probably go to maybe a full inch. But that said, you know, this is the kind of thing you want to avoid. And this is why we rack into clean containers sometimes, uh, just to avoid these nasty flavors. So that's, that's my take on autolysis. 
Yeah, I think you're fine keeping that three gallon, but you know, normal rules apply. Ryan, do I even dare come to you on now? <laughs> I think Jeff, you know, I think Jeff said it all. Yeah, I, me too. <laughs> yeah. Hey, yeah, good deal. Uh, Samuel Springer, uh, no, this ought to be an easy one. This is actually a Ryan question. Samuel, Samuel Springer on micromeads and brewers, uh, are dehydrated berries any good for mead making, Ryan? Sure. It depends on what you want to get, what the flavor you're expecting. So I have used dehydrated berries. I've used uh, dehydrated elderberries before, or you know, dried elderberries. Um, I've used dried uh, blueberries before, um, and and yeah, you know, it's going to have a little bit of a different flavor than the fresh. That in my experience, it it, it does. Uh, but absolutely, you can you can use the dehydrated or dried fruits um, to to make your meads. And I mean, there are probably mead makers in parts of the world that that's the only way they can get certain fruits. And, and there's nothing sure. wrong with that. Um, I'll also say that freeze dried fruits make an amazing mead. So the freeze drying process is is not to we held the science in the last question so i'm going to let you research this one on your own samuel but the freeze drying process is different than dehydrating or drying and it results in what i most people are going to say is a far superior product so freeze dried strawberries you know things like that are and you can use those in to make fantastic meads. Um, the way that I like using those, it, they're, it's, they're expensive, but you don't need that much. Like, you know, you can, I think like one ounce of freeze dried strawberries, you know, might be like five bucks or something, but you, that might be enough for like a gallon right there. <laughs> so, you know, or, or whatever it's, you know, they, they, they're ridiculously, you know, low weight, but that's because there's no water in them at all. I mean, they are completely dried. So the way to do those is you crush them, crush it into a really fine powder just in the bag or in a, in a zip, in a plastic bag, and then put that right in the fermenter. And, um, you can, you know, those will ferment great. You'll make just fantastic meads. So you can use dehydrated, you can use dried, um, Freeze dried will also make some some really really good meats. I used dehydrated cherries in uh, one of the port uh, meads that I made, and uh, uh, some uh, part of it went in during fermentation, part of it went in back in secondary, and uh, uh, you know uh, it has a very pronounced cherry flavor. You can absolutely detect it. So absolutely, you can use the dehydrated uh, fruits and berries. Um, <laughs> uh, I want to skip down here. There's, this one is just intriguing, and I don't know that he really. Well, I don't know. I'll get to it here. Uh, this question, I don't know who it's from, but it says, uh, I think I made vinegar by accident. I bought a starter kit off Amazon and followed the instructions for basic mead four pounds of honey to a gallon of water a packet of yeast, and a teaspoon of yeast nutrient. I left it to ferment for two months. Do I need to let it go longer, or have I quacked up? Uh, it tastes awful, <laughs> and if I have accidentally made vinegar, anyone have good recipes to use it in? <laughs> so, um, I don't know. Yeah, without a lot of data... My first question is, do you see what they call a pellicle? And usually this is kind of like it's a white film on the top, or sometimes it looks like kind of interconnected, like big bubbles of white junk or kind of a fuzzy texture. There are a few different ways that a bacterial infection presents itself. And uh, generally, if you've got a vinegary taste. Was that my motorcycle? <laughs> Was that my motorcycle? If that's your motorcycle, it's got all the way to Kansas before you noticed it was gone. So uh, it might not be your motorcycle anymore. No. 
<laughs> Continue on, please. So yeah, no, if, if you've got something like that, like the pellicle or the, the obvious kind of biofilm that looks like there's a bacterial infection in there, yeah, you might be dealing with vinegar. That said, and you know, he, he doesn't give a lot of specifics. This is a, a first timer, it sounds like. Um, he put four pounds of honey in there, which is kind of a lot. Let it sit for two months. Um, let's let devil's advocate and say that the, the yeast he's using is like an EC1118 or K1V, um, like a champagne yeast that can handle a lot of honey or a lot of uh, sugar and turn it into alcohol. Um, what a lot of people that are getting started in this hobby don't realize is that there is a substantial amount of acid in honey all by itself. And yeah. once you get all the sugar out, you're going to taste the acid. Uh, so the first time you're tasting a bone dry mead, it's going to taste kind of acidic. And I could see where somebody that isn't familiar with that process could easily mistake it for some kind of a weak vinegar flavor. Um, you know, if, if what you're going for is a sweet mead, you're probably going to need to stabilize it and back sweeten it before some of that more pronounced honey character comes out of it. Because, you know, when, once the sugar is gone, you've got everything else that was left in the honey. And some of that is floral components, and some of that's acid. Um, Okay, but so tell the guy, tell the guy on my motorcycle to quit just driving it around the block. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, so the vinegar thing, you know, uh, I, I gotta say something here, and this is this goes out to all of our listeners. Now we and we absolutely appreciate the person who posted this up, and uh, we gave it our best shot. Uh, but look, when you put questions like this up in, in different places, forums, Facebook, that kind of thing, try to put as much information as you can. Uh, it would have helped a great deal if we knew what kind of yeast it was, even the type of yeast nutrient you used. Did it, you know, did, did you put it in an airlock? Uh, you know, what was your process? So when you can give, you know, even the minimum basic information like that, we have a much better chance of more accurately answering a lot of these questions. So, I mean, no shame on this guy. I mean, he did his best here, no. whoever it was, and we certainly appreciate it. So. Well, let's, Side note to let's that. just go, go, go ahead. ahead. So I was going to say, side note to that, not only do you need to provide us information, you need to write this stuff down. You need to take good notes because you know what the most infuriating thing in the world is when you make a brilliant batch of mead that you absolutely love and want to repeat and you can't for the life of you remember what yeast you used in it. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. Ryan, go ahead. Well, I mean, let's just tell you what we do know. Okay. The guy bought a starter kit off Amazon. It probably came with a packet. A little, a little envelope that said yeast on it and it probably came with another <laughs> envelope that said nutrients in it yep you know here's <laughs> here's true. the thing um, the guy had said he put four pounds of honey in a uh, gallon of water you know I mean that's that's a lot <laughs> he's probably you know I mean four pounds of honey in a gallon of water, I mean, he could be easily into the, you know, 1150, 1160, something like that, right? Yeah. Um, if you're not, if you're not, uh, you know, agitating at the beginning, you're not, you know, you're not uh, degassing, you know, all that kind of stuff. I something like that, you are going to develop a lot of off flavors. I'll bet you, you know, a, a Grubhub lunch here that he, you know, did not create vinegar. He's just got so many off flavors mm -hmm. from from a high gravity, you know, ferment that he did. He didn't, probably didn't know, you know, any. Um, any you know staggered nutrient addition, you know any kind of degassing, any of that stuff. So, yeah, I mean it's that's what's probably that's what's probably going on, and and 
you know, the problem is a lot of those things turn me people off. I can't tell you how many times I've heard people say, Oh, I, I had a Mr. Beer in college. I used to make beer. It, it, that's I horrible. To, yeah, I used to make, <laughs> you know, or I, yeah, I made a batch of wine. I got a, I got a, you know, my, my brother-in-law gave me a wine kit, you know, for Christmas <laughs> and it was a, you know, one gallon kit, and oh. a, you know, a bladder of some juice that you fermented up or, or, you know, mead, something like this, right? Oh yeah, I took some honey and I threw it in the jug and it was pretty awful. <laughs> mead must be bad. <laughs> So, you know, it, it's more for anybody else out there that you if you haven't encountered that, you are going to encounter that. And, you yeah. know, just, just being prepared to talk to people about what happened. You you know, you're right. If, if the guy wanted to say, hey, you know, I, I use this kind of yeast. It was this temperature. The, uh, the humidity in the room was this percent. Uh, it's got so many hours of diffused sunlight a day. I mean, yeah, sure, that might help. But, you know, you're going to hear somebody who says, yeah, I got a jug. It said put honey in it, <laughs> throw this envelope in, throw that envelope in. I did that, and that was, that was what I did. Yeah. <laughs> you know, just be prepared to, to coach people through some of that stuff out there, talking to the listeners, um, you know, as, as someone might have a, you know, a bad ex- home brewing experience that <laughs> that yeah. first time. Uh, all right, uh, let's wrap it up with this one uh, right below it. Gauging optimal aging time. Uh, I know it varies with a lot of factors, but does anyone know guidelines? Uh, I'd like to uh, be more confident about when it's best to bring it out of aging. Uh, I've been making mead for about 10 years and recently sampled some from the uh, cellar going back that far. In very general terms, it seems like uh, mid-alcohol, 11-ish, 11%-ish, does most of its improving over three years after that. It's a pretty stable, uh, it's pretty stable and uh, maybe even declined starting at about year six. Uh, but I'm just doing the guesswork here with a small sample size. Any better information out there that can help me out? Uh, actually, your tongue and your mouth. That's, you know, I mean, there, there's no better way. I mean, if it tastes good to you, then it's aged long enough. I mean, if you want it to age more than age of more. It sounds, uh, Ryan, like he's got a pretty general rule of thumb going on his own. Yeah, you know, every every mead is going to be a little bit different. Uh, and, you know, if it's, a, if it's a traditional, if it's a berry bomb, you know, whatever it might be, if it's um, hydromel or if it's sack strength, you know, that kind of thing. So they're all going to be a little bit different. And, and uh, something I learned from you know, the, the wine side of the house, you know, when I was doing more wine making and wine drinking is that, you know, they're, they're living essentially, you know, and that they're, they are, if you think about it, they have a lifespan. They, they go, they, they develop and they mature and they decline, um, over time. So, you know, and every, and just like you and me and, and everyone else, you know, those, those lifespans and those, uh, maturing and peaking and declining is, is going to be a little bit different. So, yeah, I, I would say that, you know, if he's got a rule of thumb for the stuff that he makes or he drinks, that's, that's just as good of a rule of thumb as I could give you. And what I like doing is even when I bottle stuff in, in you know, like wine bottle size or 750s or, or, or uh, 22 ounce bottles, things like that, I often do a handful in smaller bottle sizes. So either six or 12 ounce bottles. And I open one kind of time. I, I open them and I, and I test them out and I just, I see how they're doing because like you said, JD, it's really about your your tongue, your palate, your taste, and and what you think 
it's it's going to be. You know, none of us are are sommeliers or or uh, cicerones or or anything like that. So it's hard for us to say that this is exactly when this has peaked or or when this has declined. But I'm not trying to be a, a cicerone or a sommelier. I'm trying to say. You know, does does Ryan enjoy what's in the glass right now? And there's there's no better way of doing that than than popping a bottle open and and putting a little note in your book as to how the uh, the 2015 is drinking right now. You know, wineries. Uh, I don't think there's a book that a wine maker opens up and says, "Age this Chardonnay for this many years, age this Cabernet for this many years." Uh, I, I don't think that book exists. Uh, and uh, I think just like uh, wineries, it's all about the taste. Uh, you know, uh, they know when it's ready to bottle and and uh, put it out to market by, by tasting it. You know, uh, I don't think there's any set year to age anything uh, that you homebrew or, you know, make commercially even. Uh uh, you know, uh, so it's a no. uh, it's a process. And if you think about it, let's let's draw another like corollary to the wine world. You know, you you don't say you don't go into the you know your your fancy restaurant or your your uh, uh, wine shop and say, hey, I want a five year old Pinot Noir. Uh, <laughs> you say, hey, I want a nineteen ninety two so and so vineyard. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason we do that is because we know that's good. The, you know, those, those years, those vineyards, they get their recognition from being good. Uh, I think part of the fun of aging is not, it's going to get better. It's more in the line of like Ryan was saying, what's going to happen? How's it going to develop? It may get better. It may not. And generally, if you start with something good, it's going to stay good. But it's going to be fun and subtle changes that you're going to go, oh, well, that's cool. That's interesting. Or, ah, maybe I should drink this a little younger. Well, and the other thing, too, okay. is uh, some things don't age well, uh, no. like vanillas. I mean, some, some of the adjuncts that you put in after the fact just, just don't age well. Pops, even, for that matter, in, in some cases. So, uh, you know, uh, it's, all, uh, it's all done on taste. Uh, Ryan, last word, but well, to what Jeff was saying, unless you're a, a Steve Martin fan and and you like the jerk, and then he, you know, when he when he's at the restaurant and he says, "Stop bringing us this old wine," you know, oh, I mean, who do they think we are? We want some new stuff from this year. <laughs> there we go. Hey, we're gonna end it right there. What a good note to stop on. Hey, uh, thanks for listening uh, to this episode. Hey, special thanks to Twilight Souls from Rouse Malt House. I'm telling you, you got to go check these guys out uh, and take a look at their list. We'll put the links up in the uh, in the show notes. But uh, some fantastic information coming from Twyla uh, in this episode. And, uh, again, thank you, uh, Twyla, for hanging out with us in this uh, episodes and don't forget hey let us know what you're brewing email us info at the meathouse.com or send us a message on facebook or twitter both at the mead house so hey in the meantime happy mead making that's it for this episode ryan flip the lights off just slam the door shut we'll be back next week with episode number 172